Well, today's reading comes from the book of Acts, chapter 2, verses 1 through 24, and 36 through 41. And, and uh, before I, uh, <laughs> sorry, before I get to the reading, I just want to say a couple of quick words here. You know, we celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ and the world pauses to celebrate Christmas with us, doesn't it? We celebrate the resurrection, Easter Sunday, and most of the world recognizes Easter as a very special day on the calendar. But today is Pentecost, and hardly anybody recognizes it, unless you're in the church. But yet, brothers and sisters, this is a day that's important because Pentecost is literally the birthday of the Church of Jesus Christ. The, the birthday of the Church that God has given us, and God has given us the wonderful opportunity of being in it. As I said, it's in the second chapter of the book of Acts that we read the beginning of the Church. The first chapter, it, it tells, tells us of Jesus meeting the apostles up on the Mount of Olives and telling them that they are to be his witnesses to the entire world. He also tells them that they are to wait in Jerusalem until they receive power from a high. And then he ascends out of height, out of sight. So they go to Jerusalem and they wait and they pray. And that brings us to Acts chapter 2. Now I want to read the first 24 verses, then I'm going to skip down to 36 and 41. And please listen as I read those verses. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like a blowing of a violent wind came from the heaven and filled the whole house where they were, sit where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now there were staying in Jerusalem God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard in their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, Aren't all those who are speaking Galilean? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judah, and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Perigia, and, and Pamphylia, Egypt, and parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, they've had too much wine. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed the crowd, fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last day, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned into darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Fellow Israelites, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did amongst you through him, as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's 
deliberate plan and foreknowledge. And you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to a cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep a hold on him. Verses 36 to 41. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and the Messiah. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart, and they said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, the promises for you and for your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words, he warned them and pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to that number that day. These are the scriptures revealing the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please, be seated. You know, it's interesting that some of the people who were there that day reached the conclusion that the apostles were drunk. Have you ever really pondered that thought? Why would they think such a thing? Well, I believe it was because of the excitement and the joy that prevailed that day. They were just so elated, so joyful, the people just thought they were smashed. You know, it's, it's kind of like the story about the three prospectors who found this rich vein of gold out in California during the gold rush days. They realized what a great discovery they had and they decided we got a really, really good thing going on here as long as nobody else finds out about it. So they each took a vow to keep the secret. Then they headed into town to file their claims and get the equipment to start digging the gold out. And true to their vows, not a single man said a single word about the gold. They filed their claim, brought their equipment, like I said, and they said it, and they headed back to the mine. But as they were heading back to the mine, a large group of people were following them. And the reason was, even though they didn't say a word, the expression on their faces had given them away. Their faces were aglow with the anticipation of the wealth that would soon be theirs. And people knew that they must have found something very, very special or else they wouldn't have that look about them. So, the crowd followed them out of town. It's kind of like the motivational speaker who was once asked about the most difficult speech that he's ever given. And he said, well, probably the most difficult speech I was ever given was when I was asked to speak at the National Convention of Undertakers. My topic was to explain to them how to really look sad at a $20,000 funeral. You see, when there's joy inside people, it's awfully hard to keep it from showing. Irma Bombeck I'm going to give her credit for the story. She told a story at a, about a little boy at a church with his mother. And he was a good little boy. He was a good boy. He was quiet, well behaved. He didn't cause any problems. But every once in a while, every once in a while, he would stand up in the pew, turn around and look at the people behind him and start smiling at them. And his smile was infectious. Soon, everybody behind him was smiling, smiling back at him, too. So he had all these smiles going on in the church because of this little boy. Well, it was all going fine until Mom realized what was going on, that the little boy was standing up on the pew looking behind him. So she grabbed him by his arm, spun him around, sat him down in the pew, 
and twisted his ear and told him to sit down and remember, you're in church, behave. Well, he started sniffling and crying a little bit. She turned to him and said, that's better. <laughs> it's kind of sad, people, that some, honestly, that some people have the impression that we come to church and it's nothing but gloom and doom. There's nothing here to bring joy into our lives. But Pentecost, Pentecost says that the early Christians discovered joy, joy unspeakable in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, again and again, Paul writes what? Rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Here's my proposition for this morning. Pentecost, let's face it, Pentecost was a once in history event when the church was born. So I'm going to share with you three things that we can learn about Pentecost this morning from this morning's reading. The first thing, and I think this is probably the most important thing, the first thing we see is the church was created by God. God created the church. The church is immortal. From the beginning of time, brothers and sisters, before the foundation of the world was even set, God had in his mind the church. And he promised, he promised that even the gates of Hades <coughs> itself would not prevail against it. So Jesus, he comes into the world. And after his death and burial and resurrection, the church is formed. The church becomes a reality on the day of Pentecost. You see, I'm bringing this up because too often, too often some people act as if we think that Simon Peter called this meeting of the apostles and said to them, guys, we're here today to talk about whether or not we should maybe start a church. And they discuss that for a while, and James makes the motion to start the church, and John, he seconds the motion, you know, and they vote to start a church, and they, they start the church in Jerusalem. That didn't happen. It didn't happen that way at all. Did you hear what the word said? Mm -hmm. It said suddenly, like the sound, like suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from where? Okay. Heaven! It came from heaven. God started the church. God created the church. God brought the church into being, and it is His church, not ours. Okay? We're just part of it. It's essential for us to realize that. Now, I don't know if you remember this, but several years ago, both on radio and television, they were running some commercials for two major Christian denominations. And both sets of commercials were saying almost the exact same thing. They were advertising to their members to come on back to church. Remember those? Maybe you do. One commercial actually said that the denomination realized they had made a huge mistake. We have drifted away from the foundation upon which the church was built, and now we're returning. We're turning back to the Word of God. Please, please come back home again. Is what they were saying. That's interesting. Because for many churches, the temptation has been to look at what's happening out in the world. And then try to get the church in step with the world. That is wrong. That is just plain as wrong as it can be. The church may never be the most popular institution in the world because the church goes counter to popular culture. You see, God wants the church to stand for truth, to be unshakable in our presentation of the gospel because the church belongs to who? God. It's His church, not ours. 
The second thing we see is the mission of the church. The mission of the church is to do what? To, to communicate the love of God to a lost and dying world. That is the mission of the church. What's the theme of Pentecost? Communication. Think about it. The theme of Pentecost, believe it or not, is communication. It's really a shame that the whole idea in speaking in tongues has become such a controversial issue. I mean, when you read about the Pentecost, the truth that comes to the surface is that God, hear me, God gave the gift of tongues to the apostle, to the apostles for one purpose. And that was for the purpose of what? Communication. They had a problem with communication because people had come from many different nations. Did you hear that long list of nations that I read this morning? You got to realize there was a language barrier that existed. Because God wanted each of them to hear the message in his own language. He performed a miracle. And he gave the apostles the gift of tongues so they could communicate his message to all those that were there that day. The mission of the church is to communicate the message. Now, if God really wants to give us a miracle to do that, and we all speaking in something, we all start speaking in foreign languages, God bless him for it. You know, bless him for it. For that miracle. Praise him for it. But you see, the reality is today, we have to grind it out. We have to grind it out. We're translating the scriptures into languages that you've never even heard of. We're trying to win converts from different countries and sending them back as missionaries so they can talk to their own people. We must do whatever we can do, but the mission has never changed. The moment, hear me, the very moment you became a Christian, the moment that I became a Christian, God commissioned us to share this simple message with our little section of the world. You are ambassadors of Christ. Have you ever heard of Rockin' Roland Stewart? Of course not. <laughs> Let me ask you another question. Have you ever watched a sporting event like the Super Bowl or Monday Night Football or, or, or a baseball game and seen a giant sign somewhere that said John 3.16? Yeah, yeah, right? Many of you have seen that. Rockin' Rolling, Rockin' Rolling Stewart is responsible for that happening. See, Rockin', that's just his nickname. His real name, obviously, is Roland Stewart. And his story appeared in People's Magazine many, many, many years ago. And it was a fascinating story. <laughs> Roland Stewart, he was a drunk, an alcoholic. <clears throat> and he met Jesus, and he accepted him as his Savior. He became a Christian. And God healed him of his alcoholism. Now, one day, the idea struck him that if he could get into major sporting events and put the word of God before the people, it would be seen by hundreds of thousands, maybe even, maybe even millions of people. So for a number of years, Rockin' Roland Stewart and his wife, Margaret, and a friend named William James, they lived a very sparse life. And they averaged driving about 55,000 miles a year into this old beat up van, telling the story and using the money they collect to buy tickets for major sporting events to hang out a big sheet that said John 316. You gotta wonder how many tens of thousands of people seen that, scratched their head, and turned to John 316 just to see what it meant. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Gotta wonder how many people did that because of 
rockin' Roland Stewart. Now that may not be your thing, but the point is, here is a man who heard God's command to tell the world. Now you see, when you and I are saved by the blood of Jesus and added to his family, then God expects us to do the best we can to communicate that message to this lost and dying world out there. That is the mission of the church. Thirdly, the goal of the church is to establish a fellowship that is unique. We're not supposed to be like the rest of the world. We're a unique fellowship. I mean, can't you see these early Christians after they first hear the good news about Jesus? I mean, on the first day, there are 3,000 converts. And they suddenly share something that has never been shared before. <clears throat> every one of them, every single one of them know that they're guilty and that they have crucified Christ with their sins. Peter made that very clear to them. But now they have repented of their sins. They have been baptized. They have been redeemed. And they have been given the gift of the Holy Spirit. Suddenly they're part of a whole new society. They've come out of a world of slavery, out of a world of superstition. They've come out of a world of selfishness. Uh, out of a word, world of greed and dishonesty, now they are part of a new fellowship where they can share things. Share things about themselves with others whom they know will listen and be kind and compassionate toward them. <coughs> Suddenly a whole different atmosphere prevailed because there were 3,000 changed people that, that God had made different and new. They were born again. Trust me, they noticed this in Jerusalem. No wonder the, the number so quickly grew to 5,000 and then into multitudes as the church spread all throughout Jerusalem. More and more and more people were attracted to them because it was so different than everything else in the world. Brothers and sisters, the church must always be that. I mean, most institutions only want are interested in what they can get from you, aren't they? But the church wants to give. Many will take advantage of you, but, but the church is where you can come and hear the truth and be ministered to. And the needs will be met in your life. We are to be different people, a different culture, an oasis in the midst of a desert, a shade tree on a summer day, a cup of cool water when you are thirsty, a place to come and to know that you won't be rejected. You'll be accepted. You will be loved. Brothers and sisters, family of God. Pentecost tells us the world changed after Pentecost because of the church's influence on the world. And you know, it ought to be the same today as it was back then. This morning, I'm speaking a lot to you folks watching this at home. If you're lonely, tired, feel taken advantage of, then know that within this place, within these walls, there are people just like you, just like you. So you can, you can come here without pretending. We can just be ourselves with all of our warts, our blemishes, our scrapes, scratches and find love find acceptance because that's what the church is to be a family of God 
for all are welcome. Well said. <laughs> Amen. 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 Amen.